Hey, welcome back gamers, hackers, coders, and everything in between. My name, well, you may know it already. It's Brandon Blackburn. I'm a certified penetration tester and security researcher, but easier to just call me a hacker, a white hat hacker. So today is gonna be a little bit uh, nerve wracking for me because I do know that there's quite a few people very interested in this topic. So we have gonna have a fair amount of people watching this particular one. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's going to be on getting you started in development, programming, coding, automation, whatever you want to call it. The, uh, the terms change, but the basic methodology is roughly the same. And the problem that I have with a lot of other guides out there is that they don't really address the big elephant in the room. And that is, well, how? I, yeah, okay, I, I type some gibberish in a place and... I get some magic, but how? Like, what am I actually doing to get started? And a lot of the courses, they tend to kind of follow the same track. And I, I don't have any problem with that. It's just a lot of them are geared towards people that are already familiar with programming in some capacity. So this one will be getting started from the ground up, from literally, I wanna learn how to program to now I'm coding. So um, today we're gonna do the uh, installation part of, this, uh, part of this. And I'm gonna jump over to the, uh, the desktop here. Now, um, we're gonna be doing, just to give you guys a little background, we're gonna be doing a, a, at least starting on working on a project on the show for making ping, basically a ping utility. Um, we may go down a couple different ways to do that, but ultimately it's going to be an instructive process for you guys, and that's the goal. So, um, we're going to go first to getting the uh, actual development software, and that development software is called an IDE, or Integrated Development Environment. And so we're going to be coding in Python, Python 3.8. To do that, you're first gonna just go to uh, your Google, your Google, Google search, and we're gonna look for Anaconda. So I know that there might be some people out there that see this and they go, what are you doing, Blackburn? What are you doing? Trust me, this is the easiest way to just get it installed on any computer, regardless of what's already pre-installed this is a great place to, to begin. So you saw I just did a search for Anaconda and Anaconda is here and we're gonna go to the individual edition. All right, we're gonna scroll down, download it. All right, so grab the version that's appropriate for your particular version of uh, operating system. So if you're using a Mac, obviously grab that. Um, you're gonna probably wanna use the 64-bit version of everything. Uh, there's not really a compelling reason to use the 32-bit versions of anything in 2020. So as of the recording of this video. So yeah, grab your 64-bit uh, installers and uh, execute them, run them, follow all the basic prompts. They're gonna say, um, do, you wanna, do you wanna do this, to do that? Just leave it at defaults. Just click next, 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 you know, and, and do, do the basics. Just keep it simple. All right, so after Anaconda, or potentially while it's downloading, you're also gonna wanna grab another utility called PyCharm. P-Y-C-H-A-R-M, PyCharm. And we're gonna search, and pull it up right here. It goes to jetbrains.com, all right? PyCharm, the IDE for professional developers. So just go to download. And yes, all the utilities that we're talking about today are free. There is no expense to get started and no expense to go pretty dang far. Um, there's not really, if you're doing this for yourself and not doing this for a business, then you can basically code forever for free. Um, so we're gonna download the community edition. All right, there's the community edition. I'm gonna cancel it because I've already downloaded it and installed it. I've also downloaded and installed Anaconda just to kind of get things moving. All right, so if you're watching this after the fact, this is a good time to pause get both Anaconda installed and then PyCharm in that order. You want to install Anaconda first and then PyCharm. Don't, don't do it any other way. You want Anaconda to be installed beforehand. Um, but yeah, this is a good time to pause and 
take care of that and then we'll just be rolling right along. It's also a good opportunity to, to let you guys know that you can subscribe to me, get videos anytime you need them, anytime you want them. And we're on Facebook and YouTube. So feel free to follow, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, all that. Share it while you're at it, why not? All right, so we're gonna assume that you've installed PyCharm and Anaconda. And so we're gonna execute PyCharm. So don't pay attention to the fact that I have professional. It's entirely because I'm using um, the professional license and because I do professional development. So I'm trying to honor the license agreement that they have. Um, so we've got a couple different things in here. You're gonna see that my environment might be a little bit different than yours, but don't get too concerned about that. Just focus on the main concepts of what I'm talking about. This, everything that I'm doing here applies to Mac, Windows, Linux, and all the like. So I've already got ping, P-Y-N-G, pulled down, and I'm gonna open it up here. Now, the way that you would typically do this, um, you've, you're already, at this stage, you've already crossed a lot of really cool thresholds where most people wouldn't know to go and do some of these things. And you're, believe it or not, you've already got 90% of what you need already. And you don't actually need to go out and get too much more. Um, there'll be packages and things, but those can all be automatically installed from inside PyCharm. So now that we're here, let's take a step back. Because maybe you've got to this point and it's, you're, you're, you're doing this. You're, you're like, okay, I need to start with a new Python file. And if you're wondering how I did that, just right click on the, pro the project and hit Python file. Okay. Um, main, just call it main. All right. And I'll do that later. So maybe you find yourself here. You're staring at a blank canvas and you have no clue what you're doing. And this is typically where a lot of, we'll call them classes or guides, will just kind of skip over some really important steps. And it's fine again if you've done development in the past, but if you're just starting out, it's really hard to start out here. Um, so let's code with a purpose. And I do mean, no really, code with a purpose. Um, so the first step here is define a problem that needs fixing. I don't know why I have an I there. Yeah. Define a problem that needs fixing. All right, so you have a major problem that you have to solve for, and that is, what the heck am I gonna code? Because you can't learn to code until you have something that you need to solve for. And you might say to yourself, "What? I don't know anything about Python. How do you expect me to start coding it? It's okay, just bear with me here. You first need to figure out something that you need to automate. And this might require a little bit of thinking ahead of time. You have the temptation to just follow what other guides tell you to do. But speaking from experience, a lot of those don't really do a great job um, explaining how to get past this first hurdle. You can learn all about programming from books, but the, the most of what you're gonna learn from is going to be defining a problem and then fixing that problem through programming, through coding, through automation. So that could be something as simple as um, grabbing some, something off of the web. In my case, I'm making something that does a ping because I have a project that might need pinging, uh, need a ping snippet of code to use. So why not that? Um, this is gonna be individual to you. And I'm, I'm not gonna say that this part is super easy because it's gonna require you to really think through the problem and consider what you have possible. Um, and don't consider, well, I don't know how to do that in programming, so how in the world can I fix that problem? It's okay. That's what Google's for. 
<laughs> and so you you might have um, um, let's see some some brainstorming ideas. You could potentially look for something on the web. You could look up prices for something. You could check I don't know NBA scores. You could check um, the weather. You could get traffic reports. You could get alerts. Here's a cool one. Get alerts for whenever there is um, a new traffic pattern emerging that could potentially cause you to have a, a slow commute if you commute still in 2020, such a thing. But maybe you don't wanna get out and you wanna figure out when the best time to avoid most traffic is. Why not code something that simply tracks the, the traffic and lets you know if patterns are starting to look bad for traffic getting worse? There's an option. You can use Google Maps for that, I've done it. Um, maybe you wanna figure out how to do something as simple as maybe draw some shapes on the screen, get to develop a graphical interface. Now that, I'm gonna warn you, is a little bit tricky. If you're doing anything that requires you to draw shapes or create any sort of pretty graphics on screen, that's going to be tricky. And I would not recommend starting with something like that. I would recommend starting with something that involves going out, grabbing some information from some location or from some file Maybe you've got a Excel spreadsheet that you need to, to do something to. Maybe you'd wanna do something for work. You've got a spreadsheet you need to, to automate. Um, you can do things like that with CSVs, so comma separated values. You can take an Excel spreadsheet, convert it into a CSV, and then take the CSV and do stuff to it. You don't need to know how to do that right now. You just need to define a problem that needs fixing for you because Defining that problem is the single biggest thing that will give you the biggest boost in getting this done, okay? So we've done that, we've defined the problem. For me, it's gonna be, I need to code something that does a ping. It just goes out, talks to a server and says, hey, are you there? Yep, I'm there. Or nobody responded, so nope, it's not there. Just as simple as that. Now, once I've done that, I, this is kind of weird. Now you might say, what do you mean select from old code? I don't have any old code, I'm just starting out. Don't forget, you have Google. And there's plenty of code out there that's already been done. All right, so let's go back to the desktop here. All right, so in my case, I'm gonna go, let's do uh, Python ping. Python ping. Wow, it's almost as if I knew that was there. <laughs> so I'm looking at this Python ping pi pi thing. Ping verbose true, okay, cool. Simplest usage is in a script. You can ping from the target and you want to see output immediately, emulating what happens in the terminal. Very cool. All right, so maybe I'm, I'm uh, looking at this code and I'm thinking, you know what, maybe I don't like how they did that or maybe I want to do something a little bit different. So here's your best buddy, Stack Overflow. And there's gonna be a lot of code here, I'm gonna warn you, that is people coding for potentially older versions of Python. So you wanna be careful to look for code that works for Python 3.0 and above. So anything that says Python 3 or explicitly looks like Python 3 code, you don't know what that looks like right now, but you will in time. Um, but be aware that there is a lot of code out there for the old 2.7 branch of Python, which it's not really that compatible. There's components that can be compatible, but we wanna try to code for the version of Python that we're using, which is Python, in this case, 3.8 plus. All right, so I can see, if I look down through here, I noted that there's a Python 3, um, Python 3 notation here. So they're, they're specifically saying this works for Python 3. So cool. It's, it says it works for Py 2, but sure. Um, so what this looks like it's doing is it's importing and it's doing some, some pinging, etc. Okay, so it's basically taking the ping command and it's launching it by itself. And if you're wondering what that looks like, it's ping, let's do 4.2.2.2. .2 .2 .2. That's what it looks like. It just looks, it's kind of bland, but if you're 
in IT, this is one of the most fundamental tools that you use. It just simply verifies that something is up and you have connectivity to it. Simple. But it's also really powerful um, because it's also telling us things like how long it took to reach that location, the milliseconds, that it, the actual point of data took to reach from your system out to that server and then back again. It took me 10 milliseconds. So pretty dang fast. And uh, the TTL, that's the amount of time that it takes. Um, how, many, how many hops are remaining before it expires? Um, there's, a, there's a thing that keeps pings from just running on forever. So it kind of has this thing where every time it makes a hop, it, it decrements the, uh, the counter. I'm not gonna get too much into that, but that's what that is. Um, so we got a reply from 4.2.2.2. 32 bytes, sure. Time, 10 milliseconds, nice, okay. So, some interesting things I could do here, potentially pinging a game server to figure out what my latency is, pinging Google to figure out whether or not my um, internet speed is fast enough. Some other possible define a problem things that I was talking about, maybe testing your bandwidth every so often, downloading a specific file and measuring how fast you downloaded that file. Those are also things that can be done. If you wanna figure out like how fast your internet is at different times a day, there's something else you can do. I'm gonna keep kind of brainstorming with you on ideas for the problems that need fixing that you could potentially program for. So just kind of look out for that. All right, so let's see. So that's what ping is. And that's what this is doing. So I am gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna flat out grab it. I'm gonna copy it right out and I'm gonna paste it in. All right, so at this point, you're gonna get an alert if you haven't already. Um, and by the way, um, you're probably, I, I just realized I, I might have skipped a step here. So I'm gonna exit PyCharm real quick. So when you start up PyCharm, you're gonna get a list. It's probably not gonna have anything in it at first, but you're gonna get a list of your projects that you've been working on. You'll just be hitting new project, pure Python. In this case, we wanna use pipenv, P-I-P-E-N-V, pipenv, all right? And it should show, you see, you, it should say something, 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 Python, but it should have Anaconda in the, uh, in the interpreter somewhere, and it should say Python. All right, the next is uh, the pip env executable. It should, in theory, say Anaconda 3. It's different for every, every build, so just if Anaconda somewhere in the name, and then pip env, pip environment, uh, is what that shorthand for, uh, is in the, the final part. Now, if you're just getting started, you likely don't have pip env installed, so, Real quick, how to get that going. You're gonna go and if you're on Mac, you're gonna open your, um, your Spotlight tool. If you're on um, Windows, you're gonna open your Start menu. If you're on Linux, you're gonna open up, depending on what flavor of Linux you're using, they typically have a uh, package search feature, or not, not a package search, a um, application search feature um, for your launcher. And we're just gonna look for, um, let's see, what is it, uh, Conda. All right, oh wait, no, no. It's uh, an, uh, Anaconda, in this case, it's Anaconda Prompt. All right, and what this is gonna do is it's gonna kick off a special Anaconda execution. If you're on, li on Linux or Mac, this is gonna be opening your terminal window. And I, I apologize for confusing you. On Mac, you're gonna go into your options, your launcher, find your other utilities and open the terminal. And if you don't know how to do that, just do a quick Google search. I'm on Mac, how to open the terminal. What should happen is if you've got Anaconda installed on Linux, Mac, and now on Windows, is you should see base down here. We wanna see base as part of the, uh, the, the, the command shell. Okay, so the next part of this is how to install pipenv Anaconda. All right, 
and I just go here and it's just as simple as conda install taxi conda forge pip env and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy that out and I'm gonna paste it into my command shell so on Windows I have to right click up here on Mac and and Linux you follow you know it'll be command V or uh, control V to paste it in or it could be control shift V just do the paste command do the thing <laughs> so paste that in oh, if I can get it to paste of course not edit paste didn't paste in try again conda install there we go I did control V on Windows um, so I paste that in conda forge etc etc pip env return now since I've already got it it's gonna say you've already got it there's nothing interesting here but on yours, it's likely going to ask you, do you want to install this? You'll just hit Y and you're good to go. While you're at it, you might want to go ahead and close PyCharm because PyCharm will, oh, look at that, updated. So there's actually some updated versions. I will take it. Always update your stuff when you can. Um, so close out PyCharm if you've got it running right now. Make sure it's fully closed. On Mac, you can right click on the icon and hit quit. On Windows, just make sure that it's not running. And on Linux, same. All right, so all it's doing is it's just running the updates and installing pipenv. And the reason that this is important is this will keep up with all the programs that you install uh, separate from the base Python installation um, that you needed in order to make it work. So that could be, you, you might say, well, what, what does that mean? It means that there's a whole bunch of programs that are pre-installed. They're called modules or packages um, that are pre-installed in Python, in, especially in Anaconda. And they form the basis for what comes with Python like the, the, the defaults. And those defaults don't need to be installed because they're assumed to already be in the system. Now, if you install something else, for instance, maybe you're querying Google for mapping information and you need to install a special Google API connector uh, package in PyCharm. Well, PyCharm will automatically say, I see that you've got a pip end running. It'll keep track of what you needed to install in order to make it work. And then it'll publish it into a pip env file, uh, the pip file.lock and the pip file. And those two files um, basically say to anyone that else that wants to use it or potentially to yourself later on, if you do need to reinstall, what you had to install in order to make it work in the first place. So very important step. It's entirely a thing that a lot of people don't really care about, but the moment you start getting more than one project running, you're gonna care because suddenly you're gonna have projects interacting with each other and you don't want that. You want them to be in their own separate containers where you can keep up with what you had to install to make each one work. And if you choose to make programs in the future, larger ones, you can publish them on places like GitHub, have other people download and use them and know exactly what they need to install to make your programs work. So I've got pipenv installed. And like I said, I just did a quick Google search, Anaconda. I just did how to install pipenv Anaconda. The first entry right here is pipenv Anaconda and I just selected this first item. So pretty easy. And if anyone's watching this after the fact and you can't find it for whatever reason, this is the command. I'll just zoom way in. Conda install tac C, conda forge, tac for, uh, conda tac forge, space, pip env. That's it, that's all there is to it. Put it back to normal font here. All right, so if you've done everything correctly, you should launch PyCharm because you had it closed, right? 
If you didn't have it closed, it's fine. Just close it and reopen it. So we're going to open PyCharm and then you should see when you do the pure Python and you do new environment using pipenv, you should see Python under Anaconda. And if you don't, then you need to go because it might look like this or it might look like something else if you're on Mac or Linux. You're going to go and select the one that actually has Anaconda in it. And you should see auto detected pipenv if everything worked right. And if you don't, well, we'll have to address that on a case by case basis. If anyone is interested, it's basically typing in, um, looking for the pipm file, locating it with this, finding it, clicking it. It's, you just kind of let it find it itself. It's usually just fine finding it itself. So you create, you hit create, which you can't see because it's kind of covered up by my taskbar, um, and it will create it. And it'll look very similar to this process, builds it out, you'll see the project, and you will have nothing in it. It'll be completely empty. Um, I did this on GitHub, so there's a few other IF files in here. Don't get intimidated by that. That's not important right now. All right, so I have defined it in main.py. Let me close out of that. And on the side here, you're gonna see there's a project um, pullout just you can click that to see the files that relate to your project. Ignore this, the external libraries, ex ignore scratches and consoles. Just focus on everything inside the folder. When you wanna create a new file, you're just gonna right click on it. You notice I said right click, not left click, right click. And you're gonna to go to new Python file. Give it a name, call it start, call it main, call it whatever your project happens to be and hit enter and it'll create a blank file for you. Um, and then when you need to get more screen real estate back, you can just hit this little minus right here and it'll hide it away. Now, what you're gonna see is pip and interpreter is not associated with any project. And if you aren't, then we need to fix that anyway because it's probably associated with the wrong interpreter because it shouldn't have used your system interpreter. We'll get it to that in a second. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to file or the equivalent on Mac and, and Linux. We're gonna go down to settings. We're gonna scroll down to project and it's gonna be the name of the project that you created. We're gonna expand that out and go to Python interpreter. From here, you should have what it thinks you wanna do, but we wanna make sure that it's in fact selecting the correct one. So we want to see virtual environments, ping, Python, ENG. Okay. If it doesn't show anything up there, then we're going to hit the gear. We're going to hit add. Pipm environment. Python, make sure pipm is selected and you hit okay. And so it's going to create a virtual environment. All right. So if you didn't have anything in there, you now do have something in there and it's your pipm environment. If you find that you're kind of like in this situation where you've got two of them, then all you gotta do is go to the gear, hit show all, find the one that's the duplicate. So in this case, this one. And the reason I'm doing this is intentionally to show you guys how to create your own interpreter because there are a number of cases where PyCharm doesn't create one for you automatically. Um, so that's the reason why I intentionally created duplicates. So I'm gonna go to the duplicate one here and I'm gonna hit minus. I'm gonna go to the original here and I'm gonna call it something useful. In this case, pipm ping. I'm just gonna get rid of the two. All right, and now that's my interpreter. So it's gonna be loading for a moment. That's fine, it shouldn't find anything, it should just be blank. Now, we're gonna hit okay, 
And that yellow bar, if you had one, it should go away because now you've got a interpreter. And if you've followed along so far, we've defined a problem, we've selected from old code, and it can be code that other people have coded. It's okay to, to work on prior works as long as you cite people and you know do the same all the things that we're taught to do, you know, cite the original source if you if you need to, or if you probably should. Um, and then we're gonna go to uh, extract the doc strings. So for me, I I make this a point because sometimes you need to extract um, like from the original author, like where you got it. Um, so by right, yeah, this place is a process shell injection explanation. So if they don't really like do much uh, in terms of like linking where they got it from, then I assume that it came from this posting. So I'm gonna go ahead and find the, uh, where is the, yeah, I'm just gonna copy the location that I got it from. All right, and in order to put any kind of comment in the code, the doc strings, document, documentation strings, you'll use triple quotes, just like that. Triple quote, triple quote, and then you can type anything you want in, in between. Oh, sorry, you guys were looking at the other screen. Um, so you start with triple quote, triple quote, and I, and I just went to the page that I got it from, and I just copied it out, and I'm gonna, this is just good practice to do. It, and, and it also allows you later, if you need to reference where you got it from, maybe there's something that isn't clear about the code that you're using, you at least know where to go in order to potentially find another solution. So source, that one, all right. And since this, they haven't included any license or whatever, most of the time with Stack Overflow stuff, they're just like, here's some code, use it if you want, who cares? But I still like to include the location that I got it from. Um, so I'm gonna put that at the bottom of the doc strings. And like I said, you can put pretty much anything you want inside. Um, and you notice there's, a, a, there's another way you can comment in Python, and that is just to use um, a hash symbol or a pound symbol, whatever you want to call it. And uh, you can put anything you want after that symbol. So hash, whatever. Um, you don't have to put a second hash, just put one if it's just for one line. Now, if you need to do multi-lines, that's where you use triple quotes. Just There's other ways to do it, but just focus on those two. If you need to do multi-line, triple quote. If you don't, use just a regular hash. Um, so. I'm just gonna look at the code real quick. And what I'm doing is I'm just kind of looking for anything potentially that could be bad. And you won't know right off the bat if you've got something that could do something bad necessarily, but with a little bit of practice, you can start to see potentially if someone's trying to do something really stupid to you. Because sometimes you might have code that's intentionally malicious um, so just be aware that it's a possibility. So I've extracted the doc strings and I've reviewed the code. All right, so next is, you wanna look for the most basic functions that you need in order to start programming. So what does that look like? Well, you need to figure out the smallest, the, the most atomic thing about what you're doing. Now think, think like an atom, how it's like the smallest building block of, of matter. Well, there's, of course, there's much smaller. I'm not gonna debate that, I'm not gonna argue. Just think of an atom as the, the smallest building block for, for matter. And when we think about molecules, they're built off of a bunch of little atoms connected together to create a molecule that's then connected to create maybe a protein, which is then connected to create a organism, which is then connected to create a, you know, a, a larger body or maybe a multicellular organism, you know, all that stuff in between. And 
Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so that's what you got to do with programming is you're taking the smallest pieces and you're building simple small things and you're combining them together to make more complex things. And you start by looking for the most basic. So in the case of ping, I have to decide, do I want to build a ping um, packet and send that ping packet off? In which case I need to have something that constructs packets. Do I need something that potentially just looks at the command line and runs something there? Okay, well, I'm gonna need something that looks at the command line. So. How do I do that? Well, do some Google searching, figure out how each little piece of what you're trying to accomplish is done. And then once you've done that, you start simple and you build complex as you go. And that is programming, at least from my perspective in a nutshell. And you are definitely looking at this and going, well, that seems, Awfully simplistic, but that's the thing. We're taking a dumb computer because believe it or not, computers are very dumb. We're taking a dumb computer and we're teaching it how to do lots of dumb things very quickly that make it look very complex. So every program you've ever used starts with little, we'll just call them dumb little snippets of code that do very rudimentary things and they pass it up to the next thing in the chain and the next and the next. So that's how you basically get started with programming. Um, we're gonna go back to the desktop and I'll kind of explain some more about what we're seeing here. Now we're gonna get into the part where I actually start talking more about the code of Python. So in Python, we've got import functions, which import different modules that your program is going to use. So if I didn't have either of these items in the code, then I wouldn't have the ability to get the operating system information or execute a shell command. And if that was the case, then my, my program, I would either have to code all of that into my program or it just wouldn't work period. That's the, that's just the simple truth. It's you either go out and you get a, uh, another module, you import a module or you make one or you code it into your program. So in this case, we're importing some built-in functions, some built-in modules as they're called, um, into this particular Python program. And then we're defining def, defining a function. And the, the way that looks is def name of the function, and then this will be your um, whatever you need to pass into the function. So it might be a good point at this point to start looking at, um, like once you've gotten to this point in our little, uh, um, our little tutorial here, to start looking at some of the more traditional guides because you've built up to this point where you're able to actually start thinking about the program and you've got the environment, you're ready to start coding, right. Crap, how do I code? Well, there's some really cool resources out there that I wanna draw your attention to. Um, one of them is called itpro.tv and they are not a sponsor of mine they are in no way supporting me financially. They do not even know that I'm doing this, but they're a really good resource that I've used for a number of my certifications and learning new skills. Their pricing is kind of expensive. Um, in fact, I won't even bother showing it to you because it will likely have changed by the time you get this video because their, their pricing kind of changes um, a lot. But what they do have is they've got this resources on air and you're allowed to watch for free whatever happens to be going on. So if there happens to be a programming course running, then you can definitely watch that entirely for free. And that's just because the live shows are all free for them. 
Um, that's always been the case and it likely will always be that way. Um, I would recommend you use their try it free thing and go in and grab the courses on Python. And they've got a number of them. You just go in there, do a search, and they have a ton of really good resources. You can just quickly go through it. It'll explain a lot of how Python works. And um, yeah, it saves us from having to go through that process here. So that about covers what I would consider are the building blocks of getting started in programming. Um, let's look at this real quick and go over it one last time. We want to define the problem. We want to go through and figure out something that needs fixing, something that you need in your life, something that's something that would be nice to have potentially. Um, so some of the options that we've mentioned in the past are, let's say, something that looks up traffic patterns. All right, maybe something that um, and, and, and alerts to big changes. Maybe something that gets sports scores for your favorite team. And I know there's a ton of utilities that already do this, fine but you're doing it for the first time yourself. And that's what matters here. I don't watch sports ball, but I know some people do. So that's a thing you can do. <laughs> um, let's see, some of the other ones that we mentioned were, um, Gosh, what were they? I should have written them down as we were going. Um, traffic patterns, sports scores. Ah, spreadsheets. Spreadsheets processing for work. And I'll... Um, I'll just cut away real quick so that you guys can see what I'm talking about. So let's talk about spreadsheet processing real quick because that, okay, so that sounds really boring, boring when I say that. This is something really interesting that allows you to create documents really quickly that you can then save the output of your program in. You can input data into your program using spreadsheets. Um, so let's go, CSV Python 3. I'm searching intentionally for Python 3. Um, now you're gonna see these docs.python.org. They are great, don't get me wrong, they're, they're great, but they're not gonna typically give you um, really good snippets of code that already work. Um, there is another resource that is absolutely phenomenal and that is realpython.com. So if you happen to see something from realpython.com, jump on it. It's fantastic. These guys, and if, if you find yourself using it a lot, it's worth signing up and becoming a member because they, they do a great resource for the Python community. Um, they break everything down into how to do every little thing. So in this case, parsing is what we're doing, parsing CSV files and they give you these fantastic actual working code that you can literally copy, open up PyCharm. I wanna create a new one, new Python file, CSV thing, import CSV with open, et cetera, employee birthday dot text as CSV file, CSV reader, blah, 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 blah. And it all just works. So, a lot of this, they'll, they'll break it down. They show you what it outputs. They show you how to do typically like any kind of like other thing you might be interested in doing. So that one was reading CSV files, uh, reading CSV files into a dictionary. If you don't know what that is yet, 
you will um, after playing with it. And um, optional things. This is just what this is what real Python does. They're fantastic at this. Um, so I direct your attention here. Um, what is this start here thing? Learn Python programming by example. Hmm. It's almost like I've gotten some ideas from these guys. Almost like it. To be completely honest, I actually have uh, always searched for things, found them from RealPython, and then I'll, I'll just look at that one page. I haven't actually browsed around their site too much. Uh, I just know that a ton of their articles have been incredibly helpful, um, explaining things that other people have kind of glossed over. And I, I'm glossing over a lot of things, and um, I'm just trying to show you guys some nice resources because ultimately, you need to be able to do a lot of Googling for every little thing that you're doing. Do a lot of Googling, figure out what it is that you're trying to do by defining the problem that needs fixing, select from old code, from code that has been developed by either other people or yourself, extract the doc string so that you can correctly cite where you got the information so later you can come back to it. Look for the most basic functions that you'll need out of that code, splice it out, and then build complex with those simple pieces. That's it. That's it. And uh, realpython.com, fantastic resource. Um, we're gonna be doing more of these guides on uh, this, this, this uh, what is it, uh, ping utility. Um, I'm gonna go and, and execute it real quick, just to, no, not this one. I'm gonna execute this real quick and let's see what happens. So option for a number of options, blah, blah, blah. Windows, building a command, ping, ping param one host. Okay, return subprocess call host is specified here. And I'm just quickly splicing through this, just ignore me. All right, so if, Name, actually, you know what? I'm just gonna be as basic as possible. Ping, and 4.2.2.2. Actually, it's a string. 4.2.2.2. All right, now that that's run, uh, that's ready to run, I'm going to right click up here and hit run main. Anything that says exit code zero means that it ran through without problems, or at least it got to the end. Hey, look at that. Beautiful, beautiful. Did that require me to know how subprocess and platform worked? No, not really, but the cool part is now I can pick through this code and see how it was done piece by piece. And fortunately, the, the people that put this together, fantastic, um, fantastic people over there at Stack Overflow um, put this together and it's, it's pretty dang nice. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna publish this real quick. And let's see, oh, I need to cancel project main. Let's do, where is it? Ah, there it is, git add. Cool, I'm gonna make sure pip file looks right. Yeah, there's nothing new added there. Nothing new added there, okay. And you don't have to worry about what I'm doing right now. I'm just publishing this code so you guys can have access to it. So VCS, commit, and Okay, commit and push. And yes, I'm pushing this to master for all you people that have done this before. Oh no, it's okay, it's just an example, it'll be okay. I'll put in a PR later. 
If you don't know what that means, it's okay. All right, so this is available at github.com slash blackburnhacks slash PYNG. And I'll probably make a shortcut link for that later, but uh, for now it's, it's right here on GitHub. So look it up and, oh, let me re refresh this. Now all the files are there. So this is my, well, not my code, but the code that I, I snatched and, and what I just executed. There it is. It works, it's good enough, right? You'll figure out how to use it later. But right now it's just getting started. Don't stress too hard about learning all the little ins and outs. Just focus on the building those blocks that you need to build and make more complex stuff as you need. But yeah, um, man, I think, I think that's about it. Um, yeah, let me, oh, wrong screen there. But yeah, thank you very much for stopping by. Really just wanted to get this out here and get you guys aware of some really great resources, get you started. Feel free to ask any questions in the comment section, especially on Facebook. I'm always checking those. Um, if you're unsure how to get there, it's right down there, bhacks.net. That'll take you right to the page. Feel free to ask questions there. And uh, we're always checking that. So maybe, well, not maybe, we'll definitely do follow-up episodes on this particular program and this setup and explain more complex processes as we get into it. So yeah. Thank you very much for stopping by. I will see you guys next week.